I'm Beth Kimberly. I'm an author and taste expert. Today, I'm answering your questions from Twitter. Welcome to Taste Support. First up, all out of coffee asks, can someone please explain to me the difference between tart and sour tastes? Here's something for you, they're the same. But in the professional tasting industry, we use the term sour, but we don't just use sour. We use the terms lactic sour, basic sour, or acetic sour. Acetic sour is the type of sour that you're getting from things like vinegar. Lactic sour is the type of sour that you're getting from things like buttermilk or yogurt. And basic sour, that is the sour of citric acid or something citrus on your mouth. This is from Eileen Terrell, and she's asking, could someone please explain to me the science of why blue raspberry is by far the best fruit flavor, even though blue raspberry isn't even real? So in the food industry, a flavor house is where product developers and food scientists go to source flavors. Sometimes they go to a flavor house and say, hey, I want an orange, but I want it to be more of a mandarin orange and it needs to be cooked and I'd like it this level of sweet and this level of sour. Sometimes a flavor house has a library of flavors that you can choose from. So blue raspberry might have been one of those wacky flavors that the flavor house developed or came from the mind of a scientist. If you try blue raspberry, I'm not sure about this, but I almost wonder if somebody took raspberry and combined it with grape. All right, so we have a question from Deonce. Does anyone have remedies for bringing taste and smell back to 100% after COVID? Crying face. It's been almost a year and I'm still suffering. One of the things that you can do is practice. You can get yourself some essential oils in a range of different flavors. And what you're gonna do is just pass them under your nose. Just take a little bunny sniff, not too much. And then you're going to tell yourself, okay, that's lemongrass. What's going to happen is slowly but surely you're going to trigger your memory and your brain to sort of remember what that was. Here's the thing. It will come back. A lot of people have had sort of phantom smells or weird smells as a result of, of COVID, but we're now seeing that that in time goes away and you can train yourself to come back a little bit faster. All right. We've got a question from Roshibi. I ate so much sour candy that my tongue is raw and it hurts now. I love sour candy so much. Why did it have to betray me like this? I feel your pain. But on the outside of sour candy is something called citric acid. And it's those little crystals when you have something sour that get into your literally papillae, your tongue, right? It can eat away at the roof of your mouth. It can eat away your, your tongue. So whatever sour candy you're eating, it might be a little extreme. All right, next question. And this is from Super 70 Sports. I don't know what Sharkleberry Finn is, but one thing I know, it is definitely not a f***ing flavor. And Super 70 Sports is also including a picture of, oh my gosh, it's like a classic Kool-Aid pack with the pitcher guy riding a shark. At the top, it says Sharkleberry Finn. It also says it's pink. Okay, so we're getting some clues here. What flavor would this be? It is not a flavor, but this is a way for food companies to own a flavor because I see Sharkleberry Finn TM. And it looks like this was produced, I don't know, in the 80s or something. And so they probably didn't get the memo that shark fin is illegal, number one. Number two, I think you do want to cue your customers into what flavor this is, but it's got this wild, like, devil may care packaging. I think it's like, come into this crazy shark world with us. It is not a flavor, but it is a way for a food company to kind of own a concept, right? Because the three top flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry are kind of out there already. I don't know what Sharkleberry Finn is, but one thing I know, it's definitely not a flavor. This is from doing it to them. This is great. I want chicken nuggets so bad. OPS, this is all in caps. So bad. Dude, why is McDonald's so good, but also so terrible? Why are they so addicting? They're so addicting because they have been formulated in a lab. This is chicken that's been combined with potato and other ingredients so it can be formed and molded and then breaded and fried. What the lab has done is to try to modulate the taste so that it's just the right perfect amount of sweet and salty and sour 
and bitter and umami, right? So those are the five basic tastes. When you can combine them in just the right way, foods are addicting. Like they can nail it. And that's why chicken nuggets, oh my gosh, just the smell makes people cave and they go for them. We have a question from Gripe Gal. Explain to me how, with all the science in the world, the taste of gum only lasts five minutes, yet the taste of onion lasts 864 hours. This gum has a coloring system, a flavoring system, and what's called gum base. And what happens when you masticate or chew product is that you're moving through the sweetener system and it's basically going into your stomach, right? So as you move through this, it tastes great. Some of the sweetening systems will use artificial flavor, which actually increase over time and allow you to enjoy gum for a little bit longer. The other thing about gum and flavor, some flavors are stronger than others, right? So if you have gums that have peppermints or mints in them. Those are longer lasting, more robust flavors. Now onto onions. Why does that flavor last so long and linger? Onions, garlic, they contain sulfur. And those flavors, as opposed to just dissolving and going into your stomach, those flavors actually get into your bloodstream. And so if you've ever had a large dose of garlic and then smelled your skin the next day, you're exuding that garlic flavor, when you're chewing gum, the flavors are dissolving. And simply put, they're not going anywhere else but, they're, but your stomach, they're breaking down. Whereas for onions and garlic, those flavors are staying in your system, perhaps for days, depending on how much you ate. All right, now we have a question from BKRU Zavon. How does the tongue know different tastes? People, your tongue has about, give or take, 10,000 taste buds. Taste buds take in information using these receptors. That's then signaling to your brain what you're about to taste. And that simple step is really important so that people don't start ingesting things that are bad for them. Back in the day, scientists thought that your tongue was divided into sections and that you'd actually have to taste sweet at the front or sour on the sides. But we now know that we have these taste receptors and they're spread evenly throughout the tongue. So you're able to taste all five basic tastes throughout the tongue. Next up, from 06 Honda CRV. Who is the person that created the flavor of Flaming Hot Cheetos and where can I meet and talk to them? Guess what? It's not a person. It's like a whole team of people who create flavors. So it's a marketing team, it's a science team, it's a product development team. And that flavoring could have taken them years to make. And guess what? They're not gonna talk to you because flavors are sort of the secret identity of foods, right? There's a reason the recipe for Coca-Cola is locked up in a safe. So you might meet one of them, but they've all signed NDAs and they're not telling you anything. All right, so now we have another question from Now Theo. And Now Theo asks a really important question. What's a super taster? The typical tongue has about 10,000 taste buds on it. And anything over that means you're a super taster, right? So you've got these extra taste buds that means you're taking in way more information about food. So for instance, if I taste kale, right? Like a really bitter kale, that bitter might be, we use scales in sensory evaluation. So for intensity scales, we use from one to 15. Let's say that kale is at, you know, a 10 or 11 for me. For a super taster, that bitter, because they have more receptors, might taste like a 15 all the way at the end of the scale. So bitter that like their gag reflexes kick in. So there's actually a way to test if you're a super taster at home. You just need a few things. Some food dye, a Q-tip, and a piece of paper with a standard hole punch in it. We're gonna bring in Brandon, who's a producer on the set, to see if he's a super taster. More than 35 papillae means that Brandon's a, a super taster. I have this Q-tip. I'm just gonna put a little bit of dye on it. I'm gonna go right in there. The next step is going to be to count exactly how many papillae Brandon has on his tongue. Uh-huh. Ooh, great shot. And now I'm gonna count them to see if he's a super taster. There's exactly 35, which is what a typical taster would have. So Brandon's in the normal range, not quite a super taster, but maybe that's for the best. Next question from Danny Guerrero. Fruity pebbles are all the same flavor, yet each one tastes different. What is the science name for this situation? Placebo effect? 
good guess, but it's actually not. The fruity pebbles are all the same flavor. It's probably a combination of, of fruits, so it could be cherry, strawberry, grape, let's say. But the colors are different. Your mind interprets those or takes that information in as those being different, a really in different flavors. A really interesting test was done with wine experts. And they gave wine experts white wine colored with red dye. And these experts, every single one of them, thought that white wine was red wine because of the red dye. And the interesting thing is, we eat with our eyes. And so we get fooled all the time, even professional tasters. Fooling consumers is something that consumer packaged goods companies have, have been doing for a long time. It's a way of saving costs. There's a reason Fruity Pebbles don't have individual flavors. The other thing is that flavor does something really interesting. It's called migration. So if you had an orange one and a green one, eventually over time, they'd start tasting all the same. All right, so Eric Sherry asks, how do pop rocks work? There's gas in those little pieces of candy that is activated when moisture hits them. The one thing that makes Pop Rocks really interesting is that it's also textural. You're actually hearing those popping and you're taking in a lot of sensory information with a Pop Rock. So it's not just about the flavor, it's like something's happening. They're really a cool product in that you're really using all your senses when you're experiencing a Pop Rock. And next up, Snot asks, why does Sprite from McDonald's taste different than a Sprite in a bottle? So the Sprite you're getting from McDonald's is flavoring and bubbly water that have come together, likely out of a machine, shh, or a gun, shh. And Sprite that's in a bottle comes from a manufacturing plant and has sort of a different profile packaging, whether it's a bottle, a cardboard box, or a film wrapper oftentimes have flavors associated with them. Where do those you know, flavors and or aromas come from? They can come from the inks. They can come from the plastics. So one of the sort of misunderstood things is that Sprite that comes out of a gun would taste like Sprite in a bottle. The ingredients in the actual Sprite drink might be the same, but the Sprite bottle could have some flavors that come from the actual packaging. All right, so we have a question from Itsy Girl Sky. Alexa, this is in all caps, how are our different flavors of cheese created? That is an interesting question. And I am not a cheese maker, but I will tell you that cheese starts with milk. They add enzymes that change both the sugars in the cheese and the proteins, and over time, those tastes can go in a lot of different directions depending on the type of milk, the type of enzymes. So cheese is incredibly complex. I mean, I tasted a cheese with a client the other day and it had butter notes, it had citrus notes, it had um, umami, it had all different notes in it. And it's all dependent on how long you let it store, what type of enzymes and what type of dairy you use. And this is from Max Attacks. Why do they put colors to taste? especially when they make pink starburst taste like strawberries. Effing liars, strawberries aren't pink. Here's why they put colors to taste. Our brain is also taking in visual signals or visual cues from food. So they put colors to taste to give us the cue that something is sweet or has a, has a flavor. If you look at a strawberry starburst, it's not like red, red like a strawberry. It's still kind of, you know, it's still pinkish. And the reason is they can't load the amount of red that you know would be required or would match a strawberry in that, that candy. That would be a lot of color. There's also a legacy around red food dye. Certain food colorings are, have been tied to you know, illnesses. Back in the day, they took the red M&M out of the M&M pack because there was legal implications around using red dye. We have a question from Men Adams 95. I'm confused. What is the flavor of Coca-Cola? And this is an incredible question because oftentimes we don't really think of all the nuanced flavors in Coca-Cola. So what's in Coca-Cola? Well, it starts with the cola nut, right? That's sort of the base flavor. But then you can have a lot of brown spice. And most of us in the flavor community think there's a little sarsaparilla in there. Sarsaparilla is the base for root beer. And then there's also this, stick with me, 
fruit flavor. When you know how to taste, you can really take Coca-Cola and analyze it and break out all of the flavors. It's not just sweet. It's not just cola. It's a little spicy. It's a little minty and it's a little fruity. So if you've ever had a, a Coke and a Pepsi and tasted them, well, the tastes are different. So the spice levels might be a little bit different, but one thing's for sure, the sweet level is vastly different. Guess which one's sweeter? Pepsi. We have a question from I'm the Critic. How does one even explain the feeling slash taste of wasabi? It's not really spicy or sour, it just burns your nose. Okay, this is actually a really interesting one because the flavor of wasabi and the spice, when you're a professional taster, you can piece those apart. So the flavor of wasabi, it's in the mustard family, by the way. A lot of people liken to horseradish on steroids, right? Because it's spicier than just a regular horseradish. So a lot of people can explain it by saying it tastes like horseradish with an increased intensity. So if horseradish is at a five, wasabi might be at a 15, but it also has the taste of a, a root vegetable and is in the mustard family. Finally, we have a question from Arg, I'm a pirate. How do I become a Ben and Jerry's flavor guru? Okay, great question. It sounds like maybe you already have some practice in becoming one. A lot of people come in to the world of flavor with a science background. So that's an option. You can go in that direction or you can get yourself a bunch of pints, take it slow, do what we call meditative eating and do a taste test right? Start really tasting what's, what's in there. And if you can start mapping the taste in, in Ben and Jerry's, I don't know, maybe you can get hired as a, as a guru. A lot of um, food companies need consumer tasters. So you can sign up for a consumer taste test with Ben and Jerry's or an ice cream company to be a taster. Check that out. Okay, that's it. We're done with all the questions. I really hope you guys learned something and had some fun. And until next time.